Many of us enjoy old movies, especially the good ones, the five-star ones, the classics. But it must be a sign of growing old when you can remember seeing one of those old movies when it was new, way back then, in a movie theater, full house. One that comes to mind for me was Tender Mercies. Robert Duval played the main character and received the Oscar as Best Male Actor of the Year for his work in Tender Mercies. Remember? It's a quiet story set in the American Southwest, out in the country, where a service station and a small motel are surrounded by three or four houses, and the nearest town is several miles down the road. It's a world of sandy soil, sparse grass, and pickup trucks. A drifter is dropped off by a motorist passing through. He staggers up to and holds up in the motel and promptly becomes ill compounded by a drinking problem. A widow with a young son who lives in one of the houses takes him in and nurses him back to health again. He has no money, so he offers to work for his keep until he decides what he should do next. He starts going to church with the widow and her son. It's a white clapboard Baptist church at a crossroads over on the next concession. His life is quietly changing. He's not drinking now or drifting. He decides to be baptized in the little white church at the corner. The film doesn't prepare you for it, and yet it handles it with gentle dignity. It's a Sunday morning service on a sun-shining day, and the quiet, erstwhile drifter is standing in the baptistry with the pastor. And with the appropriate words and a camera angle that lets you watch from above, he is baptized by immersion in the manner familiar to Baptists. And the audience laughed. The people in the theater sitting around us laughed. They'd never seen it before. They didn't know how to handle the feelings they had about what they were seeing, so they laughed unexpectedly to watch a 40-year-old man be completely immersed in water in front of people is strange. It's alien. It's eccentric for many people. So they laughed at length. I remember sitting in the dark and being jolted by that audience reaction. Baptist pastor. I wasn't embarrassed. I wasn't angry. But I remember having an overwhelming feeling of sadness, of regret, that they don't know what we mean by it. But we do, don't we? It's a God-given way of showing what Jesus means to us. Words are inadequate. Let me show you. Water enough for cleansing, water enough for holding you up and symbolizing your trust, water enough for burying that which wears you down, your sins, your fears, your selfish fantasies, water enough for rising fresh and new with a promise to be kept, baptism in water. What we're really trying to say is, look, God has got through to me 
by the impact of Jesus on my life and the profound experience of his loving spirit penetrating my inner being with forgiveness and new horizons has given me a new life to be lived. Are you listening? Do you understand what I'm saying? Or do I sense you are laughing under your breath? Words just don't completely cut it. If Jesus really is Lord of your life, then sooner or later you have to put your body on the line. Not just your signature, I signed up. Not just your word, but your body, your whole self, who you are, your whole being. Baptism is an announcement that God has given me a new life in Jesus Christ. And I've accepted it, and it's making all the difference. A lot of old stuff is dead and buried, and I'm committed to living this new beginning he has given to me. Here, let me show you. For us to watch one of our family or someone close to us, or to see someone you know who has been through some kind of hell and is born again, to be there at the moment when he or she shows you in the witness of baptism how much Jesus now shapes his or her life is breathtaking. It's beautiful. It's enough to make you want to sing. Maybe that's what we should do at anyone's baptism. We should sing. As the person is coming up out of the water, we could be bursting into singing. Let's see, uh, how about the classic Easter hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today, alleluia. Made like him, like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Alleluia, that it be good. Or for the sheer joy of it, how about an old gospel song? What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Or maybe 10,000 reasons does it just as well for us now. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Sing. That's what they did in the beginning, back in the days of the early church. In fact, right in the middle of the passage from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which we read a few minutes ago, is a fragment of a song that the scholars tell us for sure was sung at baptisms in the open air in the days of the earliest church. Verse 14, chapter 5. People standing on the shore in the early morning light are singing as they watch new Christians wade into the river, one at a time, white-robed, into the water to be baptized. As the darkness of the night gives way to the new day, this snippet of a song can be heard again and again. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. As the new disciple is buried for a moment in the slow-moving water, the already Christians surrounding on the shore are singing, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's music for a new beginning, a new awakening, a coming out of darkness into light. It's like the birds breaking the silence in the early morning mist, or the rooster announcing the rising of the sun. It's a song for a believer at the moment of his or her baptism. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, 
and Christ will give you light. Sleeping in the Bible is one way of talking about darkness. In the story of Abraham, sleep is a sign of bad news coming. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to him, your descendants will be slaves, and they will be oppressed. Darkness. In the story of Jonah, sleep is a mark of escapism, of dodging responsibility, of refusing to take God seriously, of wanting his own way. In the throes of a storm at sea, Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep, storm or not. And in Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish maidens waiting for the wedding to begin, the foolish ones are sleeping instead of getting ready, instead of being prepared for the coming of the bridegroom as was the custom. And they missed the whole thing. They missed the whole thing. They were shut out because they presumed that it didn't matter what they did or didn't do. Whether they had oil for their lamps or not, they just assumed that they would be there, the door would be open, and they would be in. The attitude of, it doesn't matter what I do, could leave us in the dark. So sleeping in this little song in Ephesians 5 is a way of talking about darkness. The darkness generated by too much self-centeredness, anxiety, fear. The darkness that comes with mistakes we make, unwise decisions, sins of cruelty and carelessness, the darkness of hopelessness and despair. Paul takes a big poke at a selfish use of our sexuality, sex to grab and use instead of to love and give blessing. He takes a big swipe at what Jesus would call our passion for bigger barns, in other words, our greed to find security in what we possess. If you haven't got it, you're going to be lost. And he makes sweeping reference to the damaging use of words, the ways we speak to each other, whether obscene language on the one hand or intentionally deceiving, lying, throwing out untrue prattle in order to make someone afraid or to divide and control. But that is exactly why the people standing on the shore have something to sing about. Wake! Sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He will be your light. His forgiveness will push back the darkness. His love for you will drive away your fear. And when you let him shine on you, you will be enabled, strengthened to choose whatever it takes to be true and just to be the person God intended you to be in the first place. Therefore, live like persons who are at home in daylight, he writes. Take no part in the barren deeds of darkness. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from death, and Christ will shine on you. To sing this kind of song is an affirmation of where your true life comes from. Your real life is a gift of God through all that Jesus Christ came to show and be and do. But this song is also a reminder that you and I have to wake up to hear what God is trying to say to us, to listen to his call to stand up and be counted as genuine human beings no longer stumbling in the dark. By his grace, he gives us the gift of being able to say yes or no, 
to accept responsibility for our actions, to understand for ourselves what the will of the Lord is, and to follow it. And this song is also a reminder that we are not alone. It is always to be sung with others, together, out of the shared experience of living in the light. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, this fragment of a song appears in the midst of a whole list of things that we are to be and do together. If we are to be people of authentic faith, he writes, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God and live a life of love. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity that comes to you. Be filled with the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God for everything. For everything. Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Ah, but there's one more reason for singing this song. There are persons all around us who need to hear it. They might not see our baptism or understand it. They might even break into laughter, but they could hear our song. In a wor world of too much darkness, it is the song which needs desperately to be sung. You might have to translate the words into lyrics that they can understand. You might have to set them to music that catches their ear and vibrates with their spirits. But in a world shot through with hostility and despair, greed and emptiness, there is an enormous need for that song which will communicate God's love and God's way to hope and healing. Wake up and sing. Yes. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we so much enjoy singing our own tunes. Thank you very much. Whatever amuses and pleases us. And then the beautiful tones of your music come through to us. And you reach us deep inside and we are caught by your love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the gifts that you give us in body, mind, and spirit. Thank you for lifting us into your light. So help us, God, to live by your light now, in the next hour, in this day, and in the days to come. And we will give you all the praise and the glory, world without end. Amen.